the chief judge and associate judge of the United States Court of Military Appeal, Gary, 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 the Army United States Court of Military Appeal is now open this session. I say the United States of America and the Son of the Lord. Before we get started today, uh, there were some motions that were filed. All the motions, uh, the four motions that were filed were granted uh, and, uh, and permission was given to use any demonstrative. Um, both sides have asked permission. You can use anything to demonstrate the, uh, uh, the argument today. Uh, at this time, uh, the court calls the United States versus uh, Ronnie A. Curtis and um, Arguing for the appellant will be uh, Lieutenant Commander Holt. Mr. Chief Judge, uh, may it please the court. Before I begin the text of my argument today, I would like to say uh, before the court, as you know, you've granted the motion and you've seen his work. Mr. Steve Hawkins will make argument as an amicus. Uh, I just would like to express to Mr. Hawkins publicly and to this court uh, uh, an expression of appreciation on behalf of my client. The NAACP in uh, general and Mr. Hawkins in particular have worked for almost two years. They've been generous with their time uh, as they've submitted uh, argument to this court. They've uh, certainly been a resource not only to the appellant but also the court and I appreciate uh, Mr. Hawkins' participation. Well, your comments are noted for the record and Thank you. you may proceed with your argument. A court is only as sound as the jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. Harper Lee's American classic, To Kill a Mockingbird, captures racial discrimination in a Southern community and in a Southern courtroom. All of us are familiar with Gregory Peck as Atticus Finch, and Atticus Finch, in closing argument to an all-white jury, states, a court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is as on, only as sound as the men who make it up. He pleads, the one place a man ought to get a square deal is in a courtroom, be he any color of the rainbow. The seminal case of United States v. Batson and the repeated opinions of this court strengthen a court. They prohibit racial discrimination. The question before the court in this case is whether the government violated the rule of Batson by purposefully discriminating against a Marine and removing him from the jury or the members because of his race, because he was black. The facts of this case are very simple. This is a capital case arising out of appellants being convicted of premeditated murder of his immediate superior officer and the officer's wife in their base quarters. The defense has never proposed, either at trial nor on appeal, a justification for these crimes, uh, uh, a justification, but only an explanation for the crimes. The racial discrimination evidence offered at trial were, was offered in an attempt to explain to the members an explanation why the otherwise inexplicable act had occurred. My client has no prior criminal record. He's known primarily by his smile, his shyness, and his quietness. The record of trial uses this word. He snapped. The NIS agents in the Article, two, Article 32 investigation immediately after his confession among themselves tried to figure out what had happened. I submit to the court looking at the government's argument on the merits, even the government was struggling for an explanation because the prosecutor's explanation at page 701 is that it was sheer hatred because the immediate superior officer would not let Private Curtis play computer games. The defense's evidence was to the contrary, that Private Curtis acted because he had been discriminated against because he was a black man. The testimony of Lance Corporal Penner at page 601 and what follows is particularly significant. He established that the 
officer repeatedly humiliated Curtis, Private Curtis, and this had a visible effect on him. Uh, it's unequivocal in the record that he called Curtis, first of all, the lost one, the lost one. Secondly, he called him Bebop Curtis, Curtis Blow. He repeatedly mimicked black people and their idiosyncrasies by, quote, jiving and strutting in front of Curtis and other black Marines. This was offensive, and over a period of almost two years of this type of humiliation and conduct, the appellant, one evening, was very intoxicated, and in an intoxicated state, went to the home of the officer, threw a ruse, entered the home, and did kill the officer and his wife. The trial in this case, no indication, no indication at all. Uh, the wife entered the room spontaneously when the uh, husband uh, did cry for help, and the uh, appellant did turn on the wife immediately uh, as his rage was vented in that moment. After he, sexually violated, didn't he? He, did, he, he, he did not have sexual relations with her, and uh, when he did touch her uh, uh, in the vaginal area, he uh, made a comment about, here is your dog, to the lieutenant. Consul, before you go on, uh, and this is an interesting point, I think, uh, the, court of, the court below us, the, the Court of Military Review, said, alluded to uh, the fact that Lieutenant Lutz had a meeting with office personnel in which he, he brought up the subject of nicknames and asked them uh, whether people uh, objected to that, the use of nicknames in, in this group. And, and uh, the court found that, uh, that there was no objection by your client, you know, to this. Uh, we, we would say that it would not be necessarily significant that a Lance Corporal, he was at that time, would not object when an officer would call a meeting uh, to ask if anyone was offended by his uh, use of these pejorative terms and language. What we submit as significant is that the officer had been officially counseled uh, about his use of these uh, uh, terms, such as calling black members of the Marine Corps dark green Marines. Okay. The trial in the case then became a racially charged event. The jury selection is what we talk about this morning, for in order to ensure a reliable verdict, we have to ensure that the jury or the member selection is, uh, is fair. The commanding general uh, appointed 15 Marines, both officer and enlisted, to this panel. And in this case, it may be best for the court and for counsel to look visually at exactly what the panel was at the time a critical matter took place. The members were, first of all, the back row chess pieces represent officers, if you please. First of all, a lieutenant colonel. Secondly, a major. Third, another major. All three of the senior people were white. Fourth, a captain that was black. Then there were two senior enlisted who were black. Then a white E7, the Staff Sergeant Edwards, who was excused, an E6. and then two other white members. So we had overall three white officers, one black officer, two senior black enlisted, another white enlisted. The person we're particularly concerned about, juror number eight, and then two whites. In this case... Where were the other four? You said there were the, the, uh, the other. There were 15 originally, and through the voir dire process, the uh, court had excused five. There were five challenges for cause that were sustained. What was the, just by way of background though, of the other five, what was the racial composition of those, if you recall, and their, their rank and so forth, if you remember? Yes, I can tell the court. Um, there was, uh, there were, the, the most senior person was a colonel, he was white, then a colonel, another colonel was white. Um, um, a, 
a uh, lieutenant colonel that was black. Was Captain Emerson black or white? He was black, sir. Captain Emerson, Captain Emerson was black. I misspoke myself. Uh, I misspoke myself. Edwards, I'm, I confused, I confused your honor. Edwards is the juror that was peremptory challenged. The, uh, the government challenged for cause an 11th juror that was a, a, a black yes, captain, captain named your, Edwards. The knight represents Captain Emerson. No, the knight represents Captain Luster. Second, Second he, Lieutenant Luster. He did sit. Eventually. He did sit. Oh, okay. Wasn't there a uh, black officer who was challenged by the defense for cause from the original 15? I said, what? There was a black officer that was challenged by the defense. By the defense, right? Yes, one moment, please. That's correct, and that was, uh, that was Lieutenant Colonel Smith. That was page 111. I was going down, excuse me, let me recapitulate if I may. Uh, the two senior colonels were both white. Lieutenant Colonel Smith was black. And then uh, uh, um, a major was black, uh, a major was white. So three whites and one black. And then Emerson was the other one. So two blacks, three whites to answer your question. Took a little bit of time, but uh, excuse me. The critical point of the inquiry we submit, though, is the 10 jurors that remained at this point. The 10 jurors were uh, three whites, three blacks, a white, a black, and two, two whites. But at least, though, wouldn't it be significant uh, that from the initial distri distribution, racial distribution, rank distribution, and so forth, there's no indication of any intentional discrimination by the, the convening authority, the person who appointed the court, there's no stacking on racial grounds at the outset, right? Uh, no, there, there was a black member on the court as the court was originally convened. Three white members were removed when the accused elected enlisted members. And when the accused, uh, a black Marine, did elect enlisted members, additional black members were added. So, when, so there was nothing in the appointment originally that uh, give, gives you any, any, any claim of racial discrimination? Uh, uh, on the contrary, what it shows is that the commanding general was most sensitive to the racial composition of the court with a black Marine once the accused elected black enlisted members and put, put the black enlisted members uh, on the panel. Yeah. So we would the, submit that that's most significant. He, he did exactly what a, a convening authority should do. He exercised his Article 25 power to ensure a, uh, a, um, um, uh, a multiracial group. However, uh, an, there, there is an objection still in the process that he did that uh, uh, personally screening within his Article 25 power and did not uh, provide a random selection for the members. That's a different issue. That's a different issue. That's a different issue. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there's nothing, once he, once he refused to do that, or once, once that, the, uh, the multiracial or the jury composition was not provided by random selection, there's nothing in the selection of the members which indicates that the convening authority uh, was insensitive to the black-white issue. On the contrary, he was most sensitive to it. And so what, what the case is about is juror number eight. Juror number eight. And that is, uh, that is Edwards. And Edwards being removed when he said basically this. On page 257 of the record of trial, Edwards said, I feel, sir, basically that it would be a learning experience and coming in with an open mind, being able to give everything, weighing out everything, and listening to all the facts before I finally say whether a person is innocent or guilty. It would be a good experience for me, and I would like to go through it. So the key words we submit are, is that it would be a learning experience, and I would like to go through it. Juror number eight, the most junior black juror or member. In, but uh, Consul, um, Edwards was not preemptorily challenged on that one statement, 
was he? Because uh, on page 337, uh, when the military judge, this is after they got th uh, the, the both sides started uh, the argument about whether Batson, United States versus, or the Batson Supreme Court case of Batson would apply. The, the judge says, well, let's have your articulation of your reasons. And the trial counsel says, my articulation, sir, first of all, in my opinion, Staff Sergeant Edwards' responses to the voir dire, while satisfactory, didn't indicate to be the kind of member the government would want on this case. And one thing particularly that he said, if I remember correctly, that he said he would consider this as a learning experience. So it was his whole, all his answers. And then he pointed out the learning experience question. And, and what were those answers? What, what else well, is in that sentence that's a reason? Yeah, well, uh, the responses, and, and if you go to page 245, when Edwards was first brought in, and 246, uh, some of the responses, uh, uh, you know, may have, may bring uh, the trial counsel um, concern about this. Uh, at page 246, he says, now, Staff Sergeant, do you believe that the government must prove this accused guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? And if the government uh, doesn't do this, the accused should be acquitted. Do you agree with that? No, sir. You don't agree with it? I mean, you know, it seems like he may have misunderstood uh, the burden of proof and things like that, which may, may start the, the, uh, the trial counsel towards saying, well, maybe we want to preemptorily challenge this person. The, the it was key, straight not later. Uh, I, I, I'd like to address it now, if I may. I think the key yeah. word in your question is may. Your, your key word in the question is it may have affected it. But this court, nor the Navy Court of Military Review, nor the military judge should be in the position of conjecture as to what may be the trial counsel's reason. Batson requires a clear, mm -hmm. articulated reason if what the trial counsel fails to state is clear and inarticulable. Well, he says, you know, there are certain things. Well, I could object because of his background, uh, because, or he knew someone, or because of this, or because that. But he said, my articulation is that his responses to the voir dire, and then, and then he goes on to particularize one response. But he, he, did, he did state that, uh, he has problems with his responses to the voir dire, which would mean all of the, to include the, you know, the shaky parts and uh, page uh, 246 and 247. Is there a case, has the United States Supreme Court or any of the circuits defined what they mean by clearly, a clear articulated reason as opposed to just a, an editorial comment or something? I, I've, I've been exploring what does reason mean? Uh, oh. I mean, and how can you say, I mean, if we were to allow, the reason is I didn't like his responses. Uh, which, is the judge supposed to pin him down? Well, which responses? And why you did, why don't you like those? What is it about you don't like them? Let's try to clear those up or something. I mean, how far do we go with this? I, we, the most recent uh, Supreme Court case is United States versus Hernandez. And let's look, uh, uh, if we may, at exactly what happened in Hernandez. First of all, when the uh, 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 trial counsel in that case challenged two, black, uh, two Latinos, uh, he, without being requested, stated these things. First of all, he, he immediately disclosed that he did uh, 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 the reason for his doing so. And the reason in that case was is that he did not know the challenge, he did not believe the challenged jurors could accept the uh, official translation uh, uh, in Spanish of the confession. Secondly, he vol voluntarily, before he was ever called upon, to articulate a reason. Third, he specifically articulated that race was not a reason. So his unequivocal statement and denial of race being a basis. This court in Cooper uh, applauded a military judge's inquiry, where a military judge, when faced with an exercise of a, uh, a, 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 a peremptory challenge against a black member, uh, said right to the uh, trial counsel, did you do it because he's black? And the trial counsel said, no. The judge was not even satisfied then. The judge said, did you consider that he was black? The trial counsel said, no. 
We have neither, in this case, a statement on the record, an express statement that he did not challenge it because of race, secondly, that he didn't consider. Third, this court in uh, Shelby talked about the possibility of submission and affidavit post-trial. It's been almost three years. We've never had the submission of an affidavit. In uh, Santiago de Villa, the court talked about the possibility of whether an affidavit would be accepted. Uh, we're not conceding that an affidavit would be satisfactory in this case, but it's significant that there has been no affidavit in three years that race was not the reason. So, uh, what well, we I, sub I think that uh, we've, we've lacked any clear guidance on what is a reason for the government to exercise a strike. Didn't I say in uh, Santiago Avila that, that, that the trial counsel probably should have to fail in a challenge for cause before he exercises a preemptory challenge? Well, uh, being generous to the trial counsel in this case, your uh, concurring opinion in Santiago de Villa was uh, written after uh, this particular case. But uh, uh, still, it's wise counsel uh, that... Uh, well, it seemed to me there was another juror, I forget his name, and I don't want to certainly embarrass any particular member of the court, but whose responses showed a lot less knowledge of the system than this particular well, court member. Uh, we a, would submit a white that, court member. That's right. And uh, th there was another member uh, that, w that was uh, struggling with uh, understanding the law. Uh, Justice in this particular, his name was Justice. Sergeant Sergeant Justice, Sergeant Justice yeah. was having a particular problem and there were, there were extraordinary well, questions. And we, so we would, excuse me. We, we have... Uh, expanded Batson in the military, we have not required the defense to show any pattern of discrimination on the part of the government. We've just said if the member is of the same race as the accused and the defense requests an explanation, there should be one. Didn't we say that in Moore? You said that in Moore. Moore so it's a, your opinion in Moore is a per se rule. Yeah, and that was after this case too. That, that's right. right. But have we ever said what those reasons have to be? I mean, have we ever given any clear guidance on that? Well, I think uh, this court has not, and uh, uh, my amicus will argue to the court and submit to the court the uh, uh, adoption of some guidelines that may be constructive. Uh, we would submit that, once again, the, the situation the court is going to be in is that when the government attempts to challenge a, a black member in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a trial with a black defendant or of any minority, such as a Hispanic in Santiago de Villa, they must bear the burden of establishing that there was not the exercise of that challenge because of racial discrimination. And uh, uh, it, it, when you do that, uh, the burden is on you. Uh, uh, there's a lot of contemporary literature that the exercise of the peremptory challenge is gone. Uh, anytime uh, 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 you exercise a peremptory challenge, uh, the uh, most recent Supreme Court in uh, Powers v. Ohio, where they applied Batson to a white defendant. You know, a white defendant has a right to have the government not purposefully discriminate against a black person on the jury. And so any, the law is quite clear that purposeful discrimination in any context is uh, prohibited under the law. If I may, uh, but Judge before, we, before we go on, I, I'm, I'm, I, th I think we really have to look at the record here and find out what was done. Uh, here we're, we're, we're on appeal and, and we're really bound by the record as to what happened here. Uh, on page 338 of the record, this is after the trial counsel offered uh, his, in, in, you know, his, and he, he, he obviously thought it was race neutral because he says, because uh, they had just been discussing Batson, the Supreme Court case in Batson, and so uh, the, the judge says, well, what's your, what's your basis uh, under Batson? And uh, the trial counsel says this about the responses, and he goes into particular about the learning experience. The judge then says, well, you know, uh, actually that's the one thing I had written down with regards to him. Uh, this is the judge speaking. I think it was probably an unfortunate choice of words, but it certainly caused me to note it. And then he turns to the trial, con uh, the defense counsel at this stage, and says, "Do you wish to be heard in that regard?" And and uh, now we've got uh, an articulation, and the judge sort of agreeing with it preliminarily. And then he turns to the defense counsel and says to the defense counsel, do you wish to be heard? And, and, and the defense counsel says, no, sir, nothing further. 
And then the judge moved to his judgment, where he says, I find that this is enough foundation to satisfy the rule in Batson, and therefore the objection of, you know, by defense counsel is overruled. Referring back to the, uh, to the request for the articulation under United States, or under the Batson case. Uh, Don't you think that the defense counsel should have, you know, spoke up at that time? I mean, you're speaking up now. But in the trial level, don't you think uh, that defense counsel should have said, well, Your Honor, that's not a race-neutral explanation under Batson. Uh, the defense counsel uh, failure to object, we would submit, is not waiver. Anything the defense counsel would say when the, if the court should find purposeful discrimination, uh, it, it can't be waived in that regard. Okay. So the failure of the defense counsel to comment. Secondly, Two comments about your, your, your question as, as firm. I, I would take issue with your, your, your conclusion again that the trial counsel obviously thought that it was not racially oriented. I'll address that in, in particular. But secondly, on page 338, the quote you just read from the military judge goes on to say, uh, it may be, un, uh, let's see, it's, um, goes on to state, uh, after it may be understandable, the, the point that I'd submit to the court, then the judge says, may not agree with it. Mm -hmm. The military judge said, I may not agree with it. And I'd submit that that's most significant. I, doesn't, that, doesn't that relate to a different thing? Doesn't it, in the reason for articulating the explanation, not that it be a good explanation, I mean, it could be stupid. The military judge may not agree, but as long as it's bona fide, and that the person is not challenging for racial grounds. Isn't that all that's required? That, that's right. It may be, it may be an inexplicable, but our concern is, is that the judge stated the wrong standard. He said your, 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 uh, your challenge may be understandable. If he had said, well, your statement may be, or your statement is race neutral under Batson, and they had just taken a 30-minute recess in order to do so, then the judge would have stated the appropriate legal standard. But there are two things. There are two things about the uh, judge's uh, comment which are, are significant. First of all, he stated the uh, uh, standard wrong. It's not understandable. It's race neutral. And secondly, uh, he said uh, there are other blacks that remain on the jury. And we would submit that this is significant in the context because the judge, by that comment, and the prosecutor, by his comment, immediately after his exercise, uh, the challenge, demonstrated they misunderstood the holding of Batson. The holding of Batson is basically in these two words, any and all. Batson establishes a prohibition against racial discrimination against any juror. If juror number eight were challenged because of his race, it's purposeful discrimination and my client gets a new trial. The, the fact that there are three black jurors that remain and it's not a monochromatic all-white jury is irrelevant. And significantly, if the uh, chief judge... But let me ask you this. I, I certainly agree with you that you could have, you could have uh, 12 uh, on a jury, a state jury, you could have uh, 12 blacks, and if only one of them was challenged, it would make no difference. It would be the remainder. But isn't it significant in terms of try you're trying to psychoanalyze that trial counsel, decide what he has in mind. Isn't it uh, significant under the particular circumstance if he says, I'm not doing it for racial grounds, uh, that there are others remaining. Uh, as for example, if he were really trying to do it for racial grounds, might he not have, have, have uh, proceeded in a different way? Might he not have had other challenges for cause, attempting to keep off other blacks? The, the, I, I, these are a variety of factors, and we would submit that that is one factor that remains. But we, what's, what's critical in this case is the trial counsel's statement on page 334, 335 of the record of trial when he exercised the challenge. And that, that indicates that he misunderstood Batson. He misunderstood Batson because he states, Your Honor, immediately when he, when he removed juror number eight, immediately when he removed the most junior black juror, and, and he was, uh, uh, the defense counsel objected, the military judge said, What do you have to say? He said, Your Honor, it's a peremptory challenge. I know the Supreme Court has made a decision that you cannot peremptory challenge black members off the court and thereby reduce the court being to being all white. 
to being solely white, excuse me, solely white. However, in this case, there are three blacks remaining on the court, and then he names them. So therefore, the government does not feel obliged to disclose the challenge for, uh, by, uh, for, for a peremptory, uh, to disclose the reason for a peremptory challenge other than it's a peremptory challenge. And so the, the trial where, counsel where is that in the record? That's on page, page 334, 335. So what he's doing is denying that he had a reason. But we, we I mean, said, the reason that he gave that Judge Sullivan was talking about a moment ago, he is now recanting and he, said he's not given a reason. Not only has he said he's not giving a reason, which we would say is the refusal, which is significant, but, but what's even more significant is he misstates the law. He says, there's no problem here. Batson says that you can't make a monochromatic jury all white. Batson doesn't say that. Batson says you can't remove any man because of your race. And th this case comes down to those two words, any and all. Batson prohibits removing one juror because of his race. Wasn't this uh, statement, the statement you had was from the trial counsel, right? That's correct. And that was, then the judge didn't agree with him, wasn't that it? So he made him give an explanation. Uh, excuse me, it's even, uh, the facts are even worse for the government in that regard, uh, uh, Judge Everett. The judge said, let's take a break and read Batson. So they took a break, they took a 30 minute recess, and they come back in and the judge says, what do you have to say? And here's what the trial counsel said. Your Honor, I believe the case can be distinguished. In, the case, the prosecutor, in, in that case, the pro prosecutor used his peremptory challenge to take four, four black members off the jury. What more could he say? He had four black jurors in front of him. In other words, he's saying, I can't make a monochromatic jury. That's what Batson prohibits. And then he says, that is not the case here. Implicit in his comments at page 334, 335, and then at page 336, with the interim 30-minute recess to read the Supreme Court case, he comes back and says, I'm not going to tell you. It's a peremptory challenge. But then the judge didn't agree with him. And, and, and the judge, you can go on. It, yes. It, it, I'd you, like to. Did you cut your argument deliberately short? I'll, I'll go ahead and use uh, another 10 minutes of my time now. Okay. Because I have some questions not yes. related to this issue that I want to get into when my brothers finish this issue. You got any more questions? If I, if I may, could I just go ahead, Well, I please. think you should finish your point, and then we can get to Judge Cox's point. Yes. Go ahead, Commander. The most significant point is, is that, and this is a, the, distinguishing from Hernandez again, Judge Cox, in response to your questions, it's going to be a combination of the factors. Just bear with me again for one minute, if you may, and I go through the summary of the major points. A combination of the factors. First of all, uh, in Hernandez, the most recent Supreme Court case, there was not a knowing, intentional challenge to a Latino. In this case, we have a knowing, intentional challenge to a black juror. Then we have, first of all, the immediate response, which is a refusal to state. I mean, a re immediate response is a misstatement of the law. And secondly, then a refusal twice. A refusal immediately to state a reason, then after a 30-minute recess and the opportunity for Batson, a refusal to state the reason. Then when we have a disclosure, the disclosure is only pursuant to the demand of the military judge. What is the motive? Uh, if the court would look at page 16 of the record of trial, you'll see that when the government, in the, when the defense in this case made a motion for a cross-section of the jury to, uh, um, it's page 19 of the record of trial, the defense made a motion for the convening authority to make a, a jury by random selection. And they called Dr. Ingolstadter a clinical psychologist to testify about uh, the uh, uh, composition of the jury. And when Dr. Ingolstadter finished talking about the officers identifying with the victim, the fact that there were officers and they would identify with the victim and his wife, the, def the government counsel, the trial counsel in cross-examination solicited a question uh, response from the expert. And this belies the prosecutor's motive in this case. He said, and the fact that there are six black jurors on the case, that's a factor favorable to the defendant. That was a clear, unequivocal signal at page 19 of the record of trial that the prosecutor knew that the black jurors were favorable. The prosecutor voir dired every member in the whole case on racial discrimination. It's clear that in this case that the prosecutor was manipulating the jury in an attempt to remove the most junior black man. In, in uh, Shelby, if I'm, in Shelby, the NMCMR court allowed a peremptory challenge to the most junior member. That would have been juror 10. 
But it wasn't the most junior member. It was the most junior black member that was removed. So there was a clear attempt to manipulate the uh, challenge. We would submit that it's a subter subterfuge, a pretext. And above all, if we scrutinize the words, how can it be stated in a court of law that when a citizen of this country and a Marine comes in court and says, as, as juror number eight stated, it'll be a learning experience and I want to participate in the justice process. And that's what he said. I want to go through. I want to be here. And the government says, no, you can't participate. Is that, is that fit? Does that fit within racially neutral and a, and a valid justification for excusing a juror? We would submit that that shouldn't be the message that should be sent anywhere. And if, if, in fact, though, that was the reason for the trial counsel, if it had nothing to do with race, if he, was, if he said, I don't want anybody to get OJ on the job training as a juror, that would satisfy Batson, wouldn't it? I mean, he could, he could say, I don't like the color of your eyes, I don't like your height, anything except a racial explanation. If, if it was bona fide, it would be sufficient to get around Batson. Is that correct? Well, well, no. There could be, a, 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 and I'm sure there, there are a variety of other answers that would be discriminatory, not just racial, that would be improper or impermissible. Uh, a person's religion. It has to be something that violates equal protection, and that's the sole grounds well, of that. It could be religion. It could be uh, uh, sex discrimination. Sex discrimination. All right, gender, race, race, creeds, color, sex, national origin. You had one juror who was challenged for cause because of his religion. Uh, yes. You didn't raise a Batson issue on him. Perhaps the uh, defense counsel should have raised a Batson issue with respect to juror, uh, to Emerson. The fact that he had strong spiritual convictions and, uh, uh, but even with Emerson, uh, the uh, captain that was removed, uh, that's the other issue. The, I, the, significant, the significant point, excuse me. I, I have some other questions about the record if you, yes. I'd like to. One, you conceded in your beginning of your oral argument that he entered the door through a ruse. Uh, what does his confession indicate? When did, he, when did he tell him that Red had been in an accident or something? Was, that, was he standing outside the door? Was the door still latched at that time? Do we know that? It, it doesn't indicate. The record nearly n never indicates. It, it's rather general. And at the common law, if he had opened the door and saw that it was Curtis, if the victim had opened the door and saw it was Curtis, and Curtis enters, crosses the threshold before he gives him the ruse. That would not have been burglary, would it? Uh, th that is a, an issue that was assigned by the, uh, by the ACLU and that there was a no uh, 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 clearly under the, under the law, that's correct. Uh, additionally, the question is whether or not there was a constructive breaking even giving the ruse. Have you found any cases on that other, other than the gas meter, the one that the, the judge used where it concealed in a box and came through the door or pretended he was a gas meter checker or a telephone fixer nope. or something like that? We'll look again, though. But what if you actually, what, is it capital murder if you come to someone's house and they invite you in and you shoot and kill them? If they go to someone's house and they know you and you give them some explanation and they invite you in, one becomes a capital offense and the other one is not? Both, ca both cases you're going to the house for the purpose of killing them? Well, the government has attempted to establish that there was a felony murder. That was a different uh, aggravating factor. And so where the, the underlying felony to support the aggravator was the uh, uh, a burglary. So you, when you talk about he entered through a ruse, then you're not, you're not saying that was totally supported by the record. You were just, you don't concede that? Not at all. Okay. Secondly, on the instructions to the members on your issue dealing with instruction to the members. Uh, is there anywhere that the military judge instructed the members that not, even if they found beyond, even if they unanimously found beyond a reasonable doubt the aggravating circumstances, and even if they found that the aggravating circumstances outweighed the mitigating circumstances, that they could nevertheless return, they didn't have to return the death penalty? That's RCM 1006, isn't it? I mean, is, is there anywhere no. where the military judge instructed them to that? It, it is not. And one of the major problems in this case was that early on in the record, the military judge ceded instructing the jury to, with respect to the law, basically, to the counsel. And oh. it, may, may I just a moment, please? Nowhere until closing argument, uh, closing instructions on the merits, 
does the military judge explain the RCM 1004 sentencing mechanism? We have nine jurors that sit through a trial for days and never have been instructed what they must be looking for. They were never given a road map. They were never told. Well, what, well, what concerns me, though, in reading the instructions, and I'd just like your view on this, in reading the instructions, one could conclude, if you were a member, that if the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances, they should return the death penalty. Uh, well, yes, and, but that, and that, that doesn't seem to leave them the alternative of no matter how aggravating the circumstances may be, they still have the right. Even one of them has a right to be opposed to that death penalty. Again, uh, you're exactly right. There are two distinct steps in determining a sentence of death. The first step is to determine whether uh, someone is death eligible. And RCM 1004 requires the government to produce aggravating factors. Those factors are found unanimously. The members must uh, 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 balance those aggravators and mitigators and find that the aggravators substantially outweigh the mitigators in considering any other aggravating evidence. Then, at that point, RCM 1004 is complete and the accused is now death eligible. If uh, I'm sure, I would uh, like to believe the court may remember the visual we used in the first part of the argument with the inverted triangle, and we had the, the who drew the line was the issue, and everything below the line was red. Only if the jurors determine that their aggravating factors is the accused in that red death eligible category. But now they don't say you get the death penalty, now they must say okay, you're eligible for death, you're eligible for death, but that doesn't mean that we're going to give you death. And significantly with respect to the instructions on our initial brief, we proposed to this court the, uh, the uh, capital sentencing worksheet used in the state of Maryland. Well, the reason I was concerned about this is, is reading Captain Emerson's answers on Boy Dyer. It looked like he was saying that he could find guilt or innocence and he could even find the aggravating circumstances, and he could even find that the aggravating circumstances outweighed the mitigating circumstances, but he didn't feel like he could vote for the death penalty. And, uh, but I didn't see an instruction to the remaining members that once they got there, they could nevertheless vote for life. It's not there, Your Honor. It is not in the record. And only one of them could have held it up, is that right? Uh, that's correct, and, and that's a, and the, another deficient dimension of the instructions was this. The jurors were never uh, fully instructed to make it clear and explicit, and there were no capital sentencing proposed instructions that made the mechanism of RCM 1004 clear to the members or to the judge. They were and not proposed. If, if your client prevailed on an instructional error in sentencing, he would be entitled to a rehearing on sentence. Is that correct? That's correct. Whereas if he prevailed on your Batson issue, he's entitled to a new trial entirely. That's right. But we would submit that uh, I understand your point you must of address view. the Batson issue first. I understand your point of view. I'm just trying to. It's, it's just like uh, the Batson issue is uh, going out to the ball game and the, the, the uh, managers from both sides meeting at home plate and discussing the ground rules of uh, what's, how the game's going to be played. If, if we were to determine that uh, common law of, of burglary would not have, uh, this would not have been a crime under the common law. He would be entitled to a new trial again, wouldn't he? Wasn't he found guilty of burglary? Uh, yes, he was. Well, under, under Clemens, if I'm not mistaken, I think the court uh, uh, would be able to uh, uh, um, just affirm the two murder cases? Uh, we would submit that you can't confirm, but that's an issue uh, to be candid with the court that you would have to address. Uh, if you would find that he couldn't, couldn't be found, then uh, if he was found not guilty of the burglary, we would submit that uh, 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 you would have to remand to the Navy court. My red light's on. I've, I've extended my time in order to have a few minutes for later comment. I should sit down. I just one further comment. Although the uh, prosecutor and I uh, are uh, uh, opponents in trial, we share uh, a common heritage. We both graduated from the Naval Academy, and at the Naval Academy, the uh, uh, insignia says, ex trident sciente, see power through knowledge. And uh, as a lawyer, we want justice through knowledge. And when a juror comes into the courtroom and he says, this will be a learning experience, I want to participate. 
Just because he's black, the government can't take him off. We'd submit that there has been purposeful discrimination against my client that is entitled to a new trial. Thank you. I'll save the remainder of my time for rebuttal. All right. We'll give you adequate time for rebuttal. At this time, if there's no further questions from the bench, uh, we'll hear uh, the counsel for the United States. Uh, I think you, you can go ahead and retrieve your. Oh, I was going to ask you to leave the members in the jury. If you'd like to use them. Oh, okay. All right. You better, you better get all the members back. Mm -hmm. Bring all the members. The members can come back in. I think that was a very helpful uh, uh, demonstrating tool, <coughs> Council. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Lieutenant Colonel Uberman representing the United States. I would like to reserve 15 minutes of my time in rebuttal. Granted. This case arises from the brutal murders of James Frank Lutz, age 28, a Marine Corps supply officer and first lieutenant, and his wife, Joan Mary Halpin Lutz, age 28, a high school teacher and basketball coach. They were stabbed to death in their home in the married officer's housing area at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, in the early morning hours of April 14, 1987, more than four years ago. James Lutz was stabbed twice in the chest and the back, and Joan Lutz was stabbed eight times in the head, neck, chest, and back. In his testimony at trial and in two confessions before his trial, the appellant admitted that he killed James and Joan Lutz by stabbing them repeatedly with a K-bar combat knife. The physical and scientific evidence corroborates this. The four officer and five enlisted members of the appellant's court-martial, three of whom were black, as is the appellant, saw and heard all the evidence. They weighed it all carefully, and they were unanimous in their verdicts of guilty of the two premeditated murders. They were unanimous in their findings of the presence of the three aggravating circumstances, and they were unanimous in their concurrence that the appellant should be put to death. Thus, I submit they were unanimous in their rejection of appellant's claim of racial prejudice by Lieutenant Lutz in mitigation of his guilt. To the extent that these votes, each and every one, had to be unanimous, every single member was a king. Every single member, individually, independently, using his own vote, could have vetoed the death sentence, including the three black members who ultimately sat on this court, and not one did. The evidence reasonably supports their determination that the claim of racial prejudice did not mitigate the appellant's guilt. The appellant and the four witnesses who testified in his behalf on that point were impeached in every conceivable way that a witness can be impeached. Moore and Piner and Jones were impeached by their reputation, their lack of reputation for truthfulness. Several government witnesses testified they would not believe these people under oath. Moore, Piner, and Jones did not even work in the office where the claimed acts of discrimination were said to have occurred. Grounds was Appellant's best friend. Moore told NIS when interviewed in May that Lieutenant Lutz was not prejudiced. At trial, he said he was. Piner and Jones testified that they reported to First Sergeant Jones, a black Marine, and First Sergeant Floyd, a black Marine, that Lieutenant Lutz was racially prejudiced. When First Sergeant Floyd testified and First Sergeant Jones testified, they said these Marines never reported this to them. The only thing the testimony of appellant's witnesses supported was the use of nicknames by the lieutenant. which is unprofessional, which is insensitive, but it is not racial prejudice. The overwhelming weight of the credible evidence resoundingly demonstrated that this claim was unworthy of belief. Eight witnesses were called by the government, objective witnesses. Seven of them, I'm sorry, six of them were minority Marines who worked in the very office where the claim discrimination took place. One Peruvian Marine and six black Marines. And they said most of the claimed acts simply did not occur, and that what did occur was 
harmless, name-calling, inoffensive to all of them. In particular, one Marine Staff Sergeant Teal, whose desk was located between the lieutenants on one side and Curtis's on the other, within two feet of each, said these things never happened. A young civilian man named Don Mickens, a black man who had re recently graduated from high school, testified that for three months he lived in the Lutz home while he helped Joan Lutz coach a basketball team, that James and Joan Lutz treated him like a son, that he looked upon them as a second set of parents. First Lieutenant Gino Jackson, a black Marine, testified that he was becoming a close friend of James Lutz over the eight months he knew him, that James Lutz was a fun-loving man, and that he was not, he was definitely not racially prejudiced. Well, are you suggesting that if he were racially prejudiced, the death penalty would not be appropriate in this case? Absolutely not, Your Honor. This was premeditated murder. This was not in the heat of passion. The testimony indicates that the accused probably did not see James Lutz since Friday of the previous week. The murders were committed early Tuesday morning. He said he didn't think he saw him the previous day, Monday, or if he did, maybe just once. Well, I guess he, deliberated, he deliberated for hours and hours, and when walking at about 11 or so, decided to kill the lieutenant, and the murders were not committed until some three hours later at 2.30 the next morning, Your Honor. So this was the heat of passion, and, and racial prejudice, even if it existed, would not mitigate premeditated murder. But I respectfully submit that the claim of racial prejudice, which hangs over this case, is unfounded. Well, the claim that we're confronted with right now is not Lieutenant Lotz's racial prejudice, but the trial counsel's striking of a black member. And it was my intention to get to that point, Your Honor, but since uh, Commander Holt uh, thought it necessary to discuss the defense view of that evidence, I well, determined that it might be necessary to respond with the government view. I, I have read what I will call his statement, the trial counsel's statement, but I, I'd like for you to Tell me how that forms an explanation. I'd be happy to, Your Honor. Might. And in fact, if I may, I've prepared an outline of my argument, having just been served with a copy of Commander Holtz. And with the court's permission, if I may approach the bench, I'd like to give a copy to each of the judges so that you may follow it more easily. You may hand it up. Do we have a copy of Commander Holtz? Yes, we do. Let me take a moment and also present a copy to Commander Holt okay. and to Mr. Hawkins on behalf of the amicus. I'm sorry, Mr. Moore, and I didn't mean to leave you out. In light of the fact that we, we accepted the Commander Holt's uh, summary, uh, we'll accept this summary also. I sort of figured he might not have an objection. Just kind of a, a brief of the brief. So well, my got. outline's got a little <laughs> more detail, but I want to respond to your questions, Your Honor, so I'm prepared to depart substantially from my outline. Um, well, first of all, just so we have the time frame, United States versus Batson had been decided by the Supreme Court, but United States versus Santiago Avila, or Kentucky versus Batson, I'm sorry, had been decided by the Supreme Court, but our case had not yet been decided, had it? That is correct, Your Honor. And uh, so, in fact, I summarized that very point. And when at, we did, uh, when we did decide it, when we did decide it, eventually in the United States versus Moore, we eliminated prong one of Batson, and that is the establishment of a pattern of discrimination. Uh, yes, you did, Your Honor. And I think that's uh, the, the fairest characterization that you simply eliminated it. We just not said we just said we're not going to take up time trying to establish that since it's only one preemptory challenge you'd never be able to really establish. That's it. right. So I don't think the court presumed a prima facie case of discrimination. They simply eliminated the requirement to prove one. Now, there's no presumption. All we said was give you explanation in the record. Exactly, Your Honor. Okay. Now, you're correct. Uh, Batson was decided in 1986. This case was tried in August of 1987. The court did not decide Santiago de Vila applying Batson to the military until 1988. And then the Moore case in 1989, in which you held that uh, upon any objection by the defense to a peremptory of a member of the accused's own race, the government must articulate a reason. And finally, in Cooper this year, you um, you outlined uh, further some factors to be considered in, in making this determination. But as you noted in Cooper, that case like this one was tried 
after Batson, but before this or any other court had applied Batson to military practice. Thus, the judge and the counsel did not have the benefit of this court's guidance in later cases. And so they should not be held to the procedures uh, outlined in this later cases. Procedures, of course, are, are prospective, not retro retrospective. And indeed, the court in Cooper and in Moore applied the procedures prospectively. <clears throat> Now, if I may, I'd like to briefly summarize the facts because they're crucial and you yeah. seem to be very interested in them. I'm passing over the ruling of the military judge, the critical part of which is found at page two of the outline, and the ruling of the Court of Military Review, which is uh, summarized at pages one and two of the outline. The relevant facts are summarized beginning at page two. The convening authority appointed 15 members, 15 Marines to sit as members of the court martial. Nine were officers and six were non-commissioned officers because the appellant requested that his court include enlisted Marines. His request was for enlisted Marines, not black enlisted Marines. I believe Commander Holt simply misspoke. Three of the nine officers appointed were black, as is the appellant. That's 33%. Three of the six enlisted men appointed were black. That's 50%. Five of the 15 members were challenged for cause. Without objection, one black officer was challenged for cause by the defense, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, because of his prior association with Lieutenant Lutz as a superior, which in Lieutenant Colonel Smith's view made it improper for him to sit as a court member. With objection, another black officer, Captain Emerson, was challenged for cause by the government because of his inflexible religious beliefs against the death penalty, which he said would, in all cases, cause him to vote against the death penalty given the choice. So while he said he could consider it, that would not have been a meaningful consideration. That, of course, is the subject of the second issue before the court. However, there is no claim of any racial prejudice in that regard. Indeed, on the record at trial, the defense expressly indicated uh, that there was no such claim whatsoever. Without objection, two white officers were challenged for cause by the defense, and one white officer was challenged for cause by the government. One, Colonel Van Risen, was the reporting senior of another Marine on the panel, Major Beale, and um, two others, Major Cagliaro and um, another officer whose escape, name escapes me at the moment, um, had uh, prior knowledge of the facts of the case through their official military duties. The voir dire of Staff Sergeant Edwards was innocuous, and no attempt was made to establish a challenge for cause against any of the three remaining black members. During the voir dire, the trial counsel specifically asked each member of the court, black and white alike, three questions. He asked them many other questions, but each member who ultimately sat was asked three questions. Would the fact that the accused is black have any effect on your decision? Would the fact that the victims were white have any effect on your decision? Do you believe that all Marines should be treated equally regardless of race, creed, or color? Following voir dire of the members, the trial counsel exercised his single peremptory challenge against Staff Sergeant Edwards. And of course, um, actually, I think Staff Sergeant Edwards has already been challenged from this group. Uh, did you leave him out? Because we had three black members in the group that ultimately sat. So he used a single peremptory challenge against oh, me. Staff Sergeant Edwards. Ah, thank you, John. <laughs> you can have it back. <laughs> With a single peremptory challenge, of course, he couldn't have reduced the court any further. That's why we have the Moore case. The defense counsel objected to the challenge of the black court member based upon the appearance of, the appearance of impropriety in challenging a black member of the court. But he readily admitted that there was nothing he could point to as proof of any racial, racial motivation. And I cite you to pages 336 and 337 of the record. He objected to the challenge on the basis of the appearance of impropriety and said he could point to nothing as evidence of racial discrimination. The military judge noted and the defense counsel readily agreed that there was no racial bias or basis for the challenges for cause against the other two black members. That's at page 337 of the record. Upon request of the military judge, the trial counsel articulated his reasons for the challenge as follows. This is summarized at page four of the outline. He said that uh, his responses during the voir dire didn't indicate the kind of member that the government would want on this case. One thing particularly, he said he would consider this as a learning experience, which in the government's opinion, while not challengeable for cause, is why the government chose to exercise its challenge. Now this is crucial. At that point, the defense did not object to that reason. They objected to the challenge 
the trial counsel then stated his reason and there was no objection to that reason the military judge considered the reason and he said well that's one thing i had written down with regards to him i think it was probably an unfortunate choice of words but it certainly caused me to note it and then i quote he asked the defense counsel do you wish to be heard that's at page 338 of the record to which the defense counsel replied no sir now, uh, Chief Judge Sullivan, as you indicated earlier, we're bound by the record, and that is what the record says. And I might note uh, parenthetically at this point that the State v. Slappy case that Mr. Hawkins has cited to the court as a rule he thinks you should follow has been modified by the Florida Supreme Court that decided it to include this very point as waiver. One of the two supplemental citations of authority I've provided to you, the Floyd case, deals with that precise point. What the court held in Floyd, applying the most liberal Batson rule, the Florida rule, which is based on the strong likelihood of discrimination, unlike the federal constitutional rule, which is based on the actual fact of it, the Florida rule is concerned with eliminating the appearance of discrimination. The federal rule provides that there must be a purposeful intent to discriminate and a discriminatory effect. But even under this liberal Florida rule, what the court said in Floyd, is that a defendant who timely objected to the state's peremptory challenge, and there it was the sole black prospective juror, but who failed to object to the prosecutor's proffered facially race-neutral explanation for the challenge, failed to preserve for appeal objection to the explanation. Okay. Now, I'm not asking you to rule on waiver. The government doesn't want to win this one on waiver. I'm simply pointing out that there was no objection at this crucial point, and the significance of that, I submit, is the following. Had the defense made an objection at that point, the trial counsel and the judge would have been on notice that he considered the explanation insufficient. And three things could have happened, all of which are permitted under Florida law. First, the trial counsel could have withdrawn the challenge. That's what the second supplemental site is about, the Taylor case. Second, the judge would have been on notice to inquire further into the reason for the challenge. Now, they can't at once complain of the failure of the judge to inquire further when he had no guidance of the later decisions after they didn't challenge the explanation at trial. Well, I, I guess what's concerning me is I've read so many of these cases from all of the states and the federal circuits, and I can't find a case which tells me exactly what a reason is. Uh, well, what, is what is a racially neutral reason? Uh, I think the Supreme Court... I mean, has had no, a no prosecutor worth his wages is going to say, I challenged him because he's black. I mean, I challenged him because I didn't like his looks. I challenged him because he wants this to be a learning experience. I challenged him because he's from South Carolina or something. I mean, I don't know. These are, are those really reasons? Yes, the question is whether they're good reasons. And I, I think mean, are, they, are they really reasons? Or are they just some other way of explaining intuition? Or what, what are they? Or are they a mask for prejudice, as, as Mr. Hawkins is concerned? And, and, and that's a legitimate concern. Is it a pretext or a subterfuge for discrimination which is prohibited? Or is it uh, an honest reason to, to challenge a court member that is not related to discrimination? Um, what is a good reason that justifies a peremptory challenge? The problem with that is if you have to have a good reason for a peremptory challenge, it's not a peremptory challenge anymore. You have transformed it into a challenge for cause. Now, you could have a good reason which is not disqualifying reason. Well, that would be the better practice, as you said in your concurring opinion in Santiago. Sound practice suggests first a challenge for cause, and then if that fails, you've made a record, and you're bomb-proof under Batson. But while that may be the most sound practice, it's, it's not the only permissible practice. What, what, what the Supreme Court said in Batson is, is that when when the constitutional protection of equal protection collides with the non-constitutional right of a peremptory challenge, the peremptory must give way. Not that it's wiped out entirely, but that you must at least demonstrate on the record a race-neutral reason for that challenge. Uh, that, uh, that's a substantial encroachment on, on the right to a peremptory, which by definition may be arbitrary and self-determined for a good reason, a bad reason, no reason at all. So what's a good reason? Um, I think the, the question the Supreme Court is telling us to ask is whether the one and only impermissible reason is present. And, and if it's anything but the one and only impermissible reason, then it's okay. And in the Hernandez case, they got right at that. They said, and I'm skipping ahead of myself, but, but let me please do that because it's so relevant to your question. It's found at page seven and eight of the outline. 
particularly on page eight, they said, at the top of the page there, a neutral explanation in the context of our analysis here means an explanation based on something other than the race of the juror. At this step of the inquiry, and I'm quoting directly, the issue is the facial validity of the prosecutor's explanation. Unless a discriminatory intent is inherent in the prosecutor's explanation, the reason offered will be deemed race neutral. Now, I submit the, the reason here that he didn't like the guy's attitude not the color of his skin, he said he was concerned that he would look at this as a learning experience. His questioning during the voir dire made clear, and the trial judge so found, that he was concerned about having members who recognized the serious responsibility of judging a capital case and were prepared to carry out that responsibility. And he sensed something less than that in this member, and it was for that reason he challenged him that he was concerned he might not, that he was looking at this as, as a learning experience that would enrich him rather than a, a grave and serious civic duty. And, and that was the reason for the challenge. And that's inherently race neutral because as you said in the Cooper case, it's based on the proclivities of the individual, <clears throat> not, not the color of his skin. None of the other members, white or black, indicated that they were gonna find this a very interesting learning experience. Or... No, sir, no, sir. And um, some of the early answers given by this witness, as you pointed out in your questions to Commander Holt, indicate that he might not have been a very good student. But, but more to the point, more to the point. I've lost my train of thought, John. You see, you're not the only one who can do that on national television. More to the point than that. There was something about the voir dire of this member that led the trial counsel to ask him a question that he didn't ask anybody else. So while the voir dire was innocuous in the sense that the member was asked all the same question, there's one question he was asked that no one else was asked. And that is, how do you feel about being a member of this court? He's the only one who was asked that question. And I submit that's probably why the judge said he thought the trial counsel sensed something less than that attitude here. Now that answer was not asked for the purpose of eliciting um, a, a, a particular response, as, as the uh, amicus has claimed. A better answer probably would have been for that, uh, for Edwards to say, how do you feel about it? Well, sir, I'm assigned this duty and I'll do my best or, well, that, or that something been like that. A better answer, and certainly the trial counsel followed up by saying, but, but you do understand it's a very serious responsibility, to which the member replied, yes, sir. But my point is this. He was asked an open-ended question. How do you feel about being a member? He could have said anything he wanted to in answer to that question. It was an open-ended question, not designed to elicit a particular response to trap him, but just tell me how you feel. He could have said, I understand it's a grave and serious responsibility. But what he chose to say, and what is probably very revealing because he chose to say it, was I would look at it as a learning experience. Now there's something else interesting about the voir dire here. The defense counsel had no questions for this member. He is one of only two members for whom the defense counsel had no questions. The other one, I believe, was um, Colonel Van Risen, or one of the other members who was challenged preliminarily uh, based on familiarity with the facts of the case or, or some other statutory disqualification. Now, I'm, I'm speculating, and I freely admit this, but if you're the trial counsel and the defense counsel has no questions for a court member in a capital case, that might give you a bad feeling too, which is precisely why we have a peremptory challenge. And that's race neutral. And so if a peremptory is still a peremptory and is still permitted, the, the question, as the Supreme Court said in, in Hernandez most recently, barely one month ago, and this is a page eight of my outline, the court said that the credibility of the prosecutor's explanation goes to the heart of the equal protection analysis. And I'm quoting here from 49 Crim Law Reporter at page 2196. The case is so recent, I don't yet have the official site. He said, the credibility of the prosecutor's explanation goes to the heart of the equal protection analysis. And once that has been settled, there seems nothing left to review. The credibility of the explanation in this case was unchallenged. And, and, and had, going back to the Floyd case, that Florida case you mentioned earlier, had the defense counsel after this uh, this articulation of the reason uh, by the, the trial counsel, had, had, had the defense counsel stood up and says, well, Your Honor, that's a racially oriented reason, uh, or Your Honor, uh, can you inquire further or something? 
But he says that... He said, no, sir, I have nothing further. So if he had challenged it, objected in any way, that would have put the judge on notice to inquire further. And of course, we're only talking about a rule of procedure here, a further inquiry. That's not the constitutional rule. The, the, the constitutional principle here is to prevent purposeful discrimination on account of race, not to enforce a particular rule of procedure. In fact, when the Supreme Court decided Batson, they left it open to the states, as Mr. Hawkins noticed, uh, noted in his brief, to, um, to decide on the procedures. I think they've now answered that question five years later after the states have experimented by what they told us in Hernandez. The credibility is the heart of the matter. But here the reason was unchallenged. And if it had been challenged, the judge could have inquired further and examined the basis in more detail, and then either denied the challenge or granted it, and there'd be a fuller record. He would have been on notice. The prosecutor would have been on notice to, to be more specific and more clear, or simply withdraw the challenge, as is, as is done in Florida. But, but there was no objection at that point. Now, I want to emphasize, let the government's just, not trying to win this case on waiver. There was no racial discrimination here, purposeful or otherwise. And, and the Hernandez case makes that clear. Let me just ask you this, uh, Colonel Lieberman. Um, in equal protection cases, I know in some areas there's a requirement of at least rationality in classification. You, you have if it's racial, then it's very suspect. If it's gender, it's a little less so. But you've got to have some basis uh, for classification to uh, survive equal protection challenge. Now, in this area, if a, a prosecutor uh, decides to challenge for a reason which is totally uh, uh, whimsical, uh, uh, but which is not racially oriented or is gender oriented or religious. There's no classification of that type. If, for example, uh, he uh, doesn't like blue-eyed jurors or he doesn't like jurors who uh, uh, are overweight, uh, or whatever it may be, <clears throat> something we would view as rather irrational, or he doesn't like the tone of the voice, but there's nothing related in the particular instance to race, sex, religion, et cetera. Would it be your position that the that as long as the judge believes that is why the prosecutor exercises the peremptory challenge, that that is sufficient to survive a Batson uh, uh, attack? <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a good reason. It can be a stupid reason, so long as it's not one of these reasons that, is, that we've that's talked about. That's the position of the Supreme <clears throat> Court in Hernandez's case. That's exactly what they said. Credibility is the heart of the analysis. And that is my position, too, because your question indicated that if, if, if there's no challenge to that reason, if, if a reason is challenged as a subterfuge, whether it's a good reason or the most frivolous, then further inquiry must be required. But here the reason was not challenged. And this was not pretextual. This was not a frivolous reason. Uh, please, please keep in mind, and the Supreme Court addressed this part too in Hernandez, that the standard for review, because this is a pure issue of fact, intent to discriminate is a pure issue of fact. I'm quoting here at pages 2195 and 29, 2196 of the 49 Crim Law Reporter. It's subject to review under a deferential standard, and the trial court's finding on this issue should not be overturned unless an appellate court is convinced that the determination was clearly erroneous. The court further stated that where there are two permissible views of the evidence, the fact finder's choice between them cannot be clearly erroneous. And the point is this, the most the appellant has offered here is an alternative view of the evidence. Um, that may be possible, but it doesn't mean the fact finder's view was unreasonable, particularly where the fact finder saw the demeanor of the court member as he answered the questions and the demeanor of the prosecutor as he um, stated his reasons. And, and demeanor is crucial. You guys looked mad when you came in here today. And I was worried as I sat there. It looked like you were angry about something. Now you look relaxed. I had to do that on national television. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, but, but the point is demeanor is very important. For, from the look on the face, we, we, the body language read into things. The judge saw that, and the trial counsel saw that. Now, I'm not trying to make this mysticism. The defense counsel saw it, too, and he had no further challenge. So, well, so I deference what, is required. What I'm troubled about this Batson case and this progeny is that, that you can always come up with an explanation which is racially neutral. It's what is the foundation for that what, what caused you, what led you to that explanation? That's a legitimate consideration. And that's what this record concerns me. But it was unchallenged. There would be a better record if there had been a challenge. 
Well, I agree with you. They can't, the defense can't claim the benefit of having a, a less complete record now when they didn't challenge the record at the time it could have been made. But, but to address that, that's the reason I moved to attach documents which show what the racial composition of the 2nd Marine Corps Division was well, in August of 1987. I certainly don't think anyone's accusing the convening authority of not well, putting... But that, that's true, Your Honor, but, but the, the, the relevance of that data is twofold, and it goes beyond uh, any um, surface demonstration of good faith. Um, the underlying assumption of Batson v. Kentucky, as stated by the Supreme Court in that case, at 476 U.S., page 94, is as follows, and I quote, proof of systematic exclusion raises an inference of purposeful discrimination because the result bespeaks discrimination. I respectfully submit that the converse is also true. Proof of systematic inclusion dispels any inference of discrimination because that result speaks, bespeaks affirmative action to ensure minority representation. And that's what was done in this case, and that's why the rule should not be applied here. Three of nine members who ultimately sat on the court were black. That's 33%. The figures I have for the 2nd Marine Division at the time this case was tried, which I've supplied to the court, indicate that um, about 23%, 22.9% of all Marines in that division were black at that time. Go ahead and finish your point. 23.9% of all enlisted Marines in the division were black at that time. Two of the five Marines, or 40%, on the court were black. 5.5% of, of the officers in the division were black at this time. 25%, or one out of five, were, uh, uh, were bl one out of four were, were black when this case was tried. And so the, the underlying assumption for the application of Batson is not implicated here. And if, if I may just add one tiny little point. The ultimate issue, as defined by the Supreme Court itself in Batson at page 94, is the ultimate issue is whether the state has discriminated so that members of the defendant's race were substantially underrepresented. I respectfully submit that the answer to that question in this case is a resounding no. They were, in fact, overrepresented. And so the purpose, purpose of applying Batson simply is not served in this case. Let me ask you, following through on that, if I may, um, the convening authority, you say, who was one who appointed the court members, basically took affirmative action to include blacks even at a higher percentage than the ratio in that particular division. Yes, sir. The percentages that ultimately sat ratio. were higher. The percentages that were appointed were, were higher still. And probably that would be higher than the percentage Marine Corps wide. Would that be true, probably? Yes, sir. You have those figures before you. I, so, I move to attach that as well. Now, the, if, even if the convening authority was Simon Pure on this, if the trial counsel uh, intentionally discriminated, that would it would make irrelevant what the intent of the convening authority was. Is that, is that correct? He would make the, well, it's the trial counsel's intent that is relevant, not the convening authorities, but it's also the effect. There must be purposeful discrimination in intent, and there must be discrimination in effect. Remember, that's what they said. The ultimate question is whether there has been underrepresentation due to systematic exclusion. But isn't, isn't, isn't Commander Holt correct that if that trial counsel intentionally discriminated, even uh, against one person because he was black. That would violate Batson and uh, you'd have to have a new trial. Would that be true if all the members were black? Suppose all 10 court members were black and the trial counsel used a peremptory challenge against a black member. Not well, surprising, who else could he challenge if I all gather, the members were though, black? I gather that would be the rule under Batson. Well, That's under Moore, he, the trial counsel would be required to articulate a race-neutral reason under the um, um, Slappy case uh, advocated by the NAACP, that would be proof of a prima facie case of discrimination. And, and so... Um, well, I, I think if the trial counsel said he was striking him because he was black, he would be out of court. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, Your Honor. Or if the judge concluded that because the reason stated was insufficient. But neither of those is the case here. Well, I, but are, you, well, ahead, is, I, are you suggesting that because the trial counsel is in a sense the agent of the convening authority, that it is very unlikely that the trial counsel would have attempted to discriminate after his boss had basically said, uh, this is to be a colorblind affirmative action trial. Yes, sir, I am. And, and I think that's one of the several factors that you looked to in the Cooper case, which I've, uh, which I've summarized for you at uh, page, uh, page 10, I'm sorry, page, um, page 9 of the outline. 
He didn't try to uh, achieve a monochromatic panel. The prosecutor's statements support the inference that the challenge was based on the member's apparent proclivities as an individual, not his race. There was no evidence of any pattern of racial discrimination. The challenge did not deprive the court martial of all members of the appellant's minority. These are the factors you look to in Cooper. And the judge made an adequate inquiry under the circumstances um, that the basis of the challenge was not racial in the absence of any further objection. Um, Unless there are... If, if I may, I, Go I ahead, don't finish up your time, point. but you, you asked some questions of Commander Holt during his argument that went to other issues in the case, for which I have answers right here, if I may offer them very briefly. All right, we'll hear I'm on particularly that. interested in the government's view on issue three, which is the instruction. The, the answer to that is found at page 19 of the appendix that contains the written sentencing instructions. I, I tried to correlate that to the page at which the spoken instructions were given, but uh, I wasn't able to find that in the brief time. And what the judge said there is, I quote, well, you are at... It was verbatim what he read. Wasn't yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. He said, quote, you are at liberty to arrive at a lesser sentence based on your own evaluation of the evidence presented. And at every point in the instructions, he said, you may not adjudge death unless. You may adjudge death only if. So every so reference to death was... That's issue three talks in terms of a unanimous finding that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances. Well, such a finding is not required. The, the rule for courts martial requires unanimous concurrence. The, the, the vote is on whether death should be adjudged. What you described is the balancing test to weigh the aggravation against the mitigation, and unanimous concurrence is required. The only vote that is required is, is that death should be adjudged. And there's no misunderstanding on the members because they were unanimous. The sentencing worksheet attached to the record says they were unanimous. The okay. sentence as announced on the record says that they were unanimous. Okay, as I read the instructions, they were, they had, they were instructed they had to be unanimous in finding the aggravating circumstances. Yes, sir. And there were three of them. Yes, sir. That they found. And the Curtis One decision, we suggested that two of those were redundant. It double redundant, counted. Well, redundant but not invalid. Well, that one of them might have to be set aside and the Senate re-evaluated. I, I submit they should be consolidated, not one set aside, well, because both anyway, are valid. That's a different question. I couldn't find anything where the judge said, even if you are unanimous and agree beyond a reasonable doubt that the, that the aggravating circumstances are there and outweigh the mitigating circumstances, that you should uh, then and only then determine whether the death penalty is appropriate. And if it is appropriate, you have to be uh, unanimous in that. Is there any words he, to that effect? He, the only words to that effect are the ones I just read you. You are at liberty, and this was after he instructed them about weighing the aggravation. He said, you are at liberty to arrive at a lesser sentence based on your own evaluation of the evidence. I think what you're asking for, sir, is, is a life option that uh, has been mentioned previously, but that's not required. Well, what I'm concerned about is these written instructions, which are novel to the common law, well, the written instructions include this, which they took in them, which says, you are at liberty to arrive at a lesser sentence based on your own evaluation of the evidence. When did he say that? After he talked to them about balancing the aggravation and the okay. extenuation. That's page 19 of the Page 19 of the appendix containing the instructions. I, I didn't have time in the brief. But what I'm so. concerned about, if you read those instructions as a whole, it would lead a layman to believe that if the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances, they quote, do my duty and return the death penalty. I respectfully And disagree. that's what Captain Emerson seemed to tell me that he could do. If somebody told him that he had to do it under a given set of circumstances, he could do it. Well, he but said that's not he, the law. He said if he had an option, he would always vote against death. And I'm concerned these instructions don't give anybody the option. I, I respectfully submit they do because at every point... And you point, think that, that sentence on Well, Thursday I think 19. that sentence is the closest thing that approximates the language that you have proposed. Uh, the Supreme Court in ruling on this, I think, has described that as a life option, which is not required. Now, at but every point... I don't understand what you mean by life well, option. Well, to, to tell the members that they can have mercy, that, that for, for no reason at all they can simply uh, decide not to impose death. It's not required that they be instructed to that effect. But what is required is that, is that when death is mentioned, and at every point throughout the instructions here, um, the judge says, you may adjudge death. You may only adjudge death. You may not adjudge death unless. If you find, you may. He never says, you must, you should, you shall. Every reference to adjudging death is conditional based upon their discretion. And there's, there's actually an error in here that hasn't been pointed out yet, which inured to the appellant's benefit. 
And, and if you look at page 2-61 of the model instruction attached to the government brief and compare that to page... Um, well, given the verdict, I don't think you can bury it. You can argue anything inured to his benefit. Well, actually, the, it, didn't, it didn't help him in terms of the outcome, but the judge neglected to summarize the aggravation separate and apart from the aggravating factors, as he may do. And so, so that omission, I submit, in order to the appellant's benefit, it did him no good, but, but certainly um, it you, did him no harm. Do you recall the case that, that doesn't, the, the Supreme Court case that says a life option is not required? Let me consult with my uh, co-counsel here. Well, you can you, submit it later. Oh, That's thank okay. you, sir. I'm sure. And the final matter I'd like to raise was in regard to a question I think you had about the burglary. You said there's nothing in the evidence that you could recall that indicated he stated the ruse before he entered the no, house. No, I, I, I just ask if it was. I don't, oh, there I is. Don't. I have it right here, sir. It's at page 3 of Prosecution Exhibit 36. It's page 3 of Prosecution Exhibit 36. Around a third of the way down the page, this is Curtis's confession. I read as follows. I knocked on his door. He answered the door. I acted anxious. I told him a friend of mine had been in a wreck. He asked me if I had called military police. I told him no. He invited me inside. Does that answer your question, sir? Well, it answers it factually. That was my intention, sir. All right. If, if the law is, if, if you invite someone in who you know, no matter what reason they give you, is that burglary if they have an intent to commit a felony once they get invited in? He had the intent to commit the felony before he went there. He had that intent back at the barracks at 11.30 when he decided he was going to kill the lieutenant, and that's how he was going to do it. He had that intent when he looked in the window to see where the lieutenant was and then went around to the door, sir. That intent had been formulated well before he ever came to the door. And he entered by trick. That's correct, sir. By saying uh, uh, something wrong. You that's know, correct. There actually, been an actually, actually, his plan, he expected the lieutenant to let him in. He didn't try the window when he went to the window. He didn't even try the door. He expected the lieutenant to let him in, this racist, prejudiced man. He expected him to let him in, and that's what he did. In, in other words, had the lieutenant said, come on in, and then he said, gave him the reason, it would not be burglary. I believe it would be, but, but the question, as you postulated, is that it might not be. I don't think you need to reach that question here, well, because just, the rules were like stated. To, I always like to think of things in a broad sense, you know. All right, uh, we'll give you some time for rebuttal. Uh, could you straighten out the microphone there, Senator Dow? All right, at this time, uh, we will hear from the uh, amicus, the NAACP Council, uh, Council for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Mr. Hawkins. And then after that, we'll give both parties uh, rebuttal time starting with the government and ending with uh, the appellant. <clears throat> Welcome, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, my name is Stephen Hawkins, uh, counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, here as amicus. This case is about, in the context of a death penalty trial where race is a predominant issue, whether a prosecutor can strike an African American from the jury for reasons that are equally, equally applicable to a white juror who was not struck from the jury. We submit that when we look at this case, we see that on the facts, this court cannot accord Hernandez's due deference to the fact finding in this case. The trial judge did not look at the fact that Sergeant Edwards was the only member of the panel singled out for special questioning leading him to say to the trial counsel that it would be a The trial judge did not look at the fact that a white member, Sergeant Justice, of the panel gave responses at voir dire that were similar to those of Sergeant Edwards, but he was allowed to sit on the jury. The it trial judge did not look at the fact that Sergeant Edwards' answer to the additional question asked by the prosecutor, when read in its full entirety, showed that Sergeant Edwards understood fully and appreciated fully the role that he was being asked as a juror. Lastly, the, sar the, the, trial counts, the trial judge did not look at the fact that the prosecutor asked follow-up questions that assured him that Sergeant Edwards fully appreciated his role as a juror in the case. 
The trial judge merely accepted on face value the race-neutral explanations without placing it in the context of the voir dire and trial to determine if it was legitimate or not. We don't fault the trial judge for doing this, given the fact that Batson was recently decided law and this court had not decided Santiago de Villa. Uh, counsel, um, you say that the, the trial du judge uh, did not accept the, uh, the explanation or the articulation in the context of, uh, of the voir dire? That I mean, isn't that what you just said? Maybe I misheard you. Your, your, your Honor, I can. Uh, because we, we, because we if you said mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. then how do you explain on page 338 of the record where once the articulation comes in from the trial counsel, the military judge says, actually, that's the only thing I had written down with regards to him. I think it was probably an unfortunate choice of words, but it certainly caused me to note it. So, in other words, uh, the, the, this learning experience and his responses, the judge had already noted that during the voir dire. True, and, Your Honor. And so I think he did mm -hmm. put it into context. Well, Your Honor, the context of those two words, learning experience, the judge, at least from, from the record that we have, doesn't, doesn't articulate for us that he considered the entire context of the voir dire process. Not only all the questions asked of Sergeant Edwards, but then all the questions asked of Sergeant Justice. And why was it that Sergeant Edwards was, uh, was singled out for a, for a question that evoked uh, a, a particular response? Those, those, was that the that question about the feeling, how do you feel about it? Precisely, Your Honor. Now, now, all what he did was, was note those words. That is, that is nothing but a prima facie look at what uh, the articulated race-neutral uh, uh, explanation was. But, counsel, this is a very difficult area, and, you know, the Batson application. And, and, and how do you explain the defense counsel remaining, remaining silent or not asking uh, once the, uh, the judge had required the trial counsel to explain his reason why he preemptorily struck uh, uh, Edwards, uh, the trial counsel said his reason. The military judge says, oh, yes, I remember that. I had noted that myself. And then he goes to the, the, the defense counsel and says, well, do you wish to be heard in this regard? And, and the defense counsel says, quote, from page 338 of the record, no, sir, nothing further. And then the, the judge goes on. So can you help us? And actually, uh, probably the Floyd case, uh, are you familiar with that? I, I am just hearing of, uh, of the case today, and I would certainly um, uh, welcome the opportunity if, if this court so chooses to, to offer supplemental briefing as an amicus. But, Your Honor, I'm, I'm glad you asked that point, because I think I can help clarify it. All right. Batson, clearly, in, in the uh, case, says that the prosecutor, or in its opinion, rather, the Supreme Court, clearly says that the prosecutor, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> not the prosecutor, that the trial judge has a duty to examine and ferret out whether the proffered explanation is pretext or is it a legitimate explanation. And I'm quoting from uh, 476 U.S. 90 at, at 98. The court says the trial court then will have the duty to determine if the defendant has established purposeful discrimination. The court says nothing about uh, defense counsel having to uh, explain to the court why the, why the reason given is, is pretextual. The court squarely places the duty on the trial judge. Also, in powers, the court clarifies that once again. I am, I'm quoting from 59 U.S. Law Week 4503. Justice Kennedy says, finally, the trial court must determine whether the defendant has carried his burden of proving purposeful discrimination. Your Honor, I submit that the law is very clear that, that there is a duty on the part of the trial judge to ferret out uh, uh, 
to ferret out within the explanation given if there is any sham or pretext involved. Well, well how about in this case, uh, when the, the trial judge uh, <laughs> uh, acknowledges that, that he, he made a note of that very point when the trial counsel says, well, we think that you know, his answers weren't proper and, uh, and especially this thing about the learning experience. And, and the, the trial judge uh, says, well, uh, you know, I had, I had noted that down myself with regards to this uh, uh, prospective juror. Uh, gee, it seems like he, uh, if it was an explanation that caught him flat-footed or, or he, he wasn't aware of it or he didn't accept it as an explanation, uh, but, but here, it almost looks like he was anticipating that. Uh, your Honor, I can't speculate as to what was uh, uh, the reason why the defense counsel did not respond. However, I think I can help the court in answering a concern of, of yours, Judge Cox, as to how do, how do we, how do we uh, give credence to an explanation or, or determine what is a, a legitimate explanation and what is not. Th the Supreme Court makes clear in in Batson that an explanation must have at least four components to it. It has to be race neutral, has to be related to the case, it has to be clear and reasonably specific, and it has to be legitimate. And legitimacy, we submit implicit in that, requires some framework of analysis. Legitimacy can't um, be be determined just by a, a look at the, at the uh, particular re, uh, e explanation on its face value. If that was the case, then, neutra then, then the race neutral explanation, uh, that component and the legitimacy explanation would collapse together. And if they collapse together, Batson would be merely a right without a, a remedy. So clearly, uh, Batson, by making legitimacy a, a separate prong, uh, is implicitly recognizing that, that courts will have to um, develop some framework of analysis for assessing legitimacy. And that's why I, I invite the court in, in our amicus brief to consider adopting the slappy fan standards. Now, as, as I was saying, we, we, we don't fault the trial judge for what happened, but nevertheless, we cannot accord the fact-finding that was done in this case due deference because there were shortcuts. There, there was not the kind of, of, of rigorous analysis that should be, t that, that is called for, uh, especially in a case uh, in which the context of the case uh, concerns uh, claims of, of, of racial discrimination and racial harassment. Other appellate courts, as I just noted, have recognized the need to set standards uh, for trial courts to follow in assessing whether an explanation is pretextual or not. We encourage, again, the court to adopt either the Florida Supreme Court standards in Slappy versus State or the Alabama Supreme Court standards in Ex Parte Branch. They, they, they differ very slightly. Um, I noticed in reading your brief, one of the problems we have in the military is that there's only one challenge, so it's kind of hard to, I mean, for example, if this trial counsel had wanted to challenge justice as well as, as Edwards, he couldn't have done it. I mean, for, mm -hmm. for the same reason. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that is true, Your Honor. However, however and, and, and we can only speculate again as to at least, well, I submit that we can only speculate as to why Edwards well, that's, was, that's, that's what's giving me concern about this whole area. What if, the, what if an underlying reason in this case mm -hmm. was that the prosecutor could demonstrate to you and to me and to the world that he is a, basically a racially neutral type of person and he was not striking this particular jury, juror because he was an African American, but because he was of the same race as the defendant and therefore more likely to be sympathetic to him than Justice, who was of a different race. Otherwise, he had the same reason to strike both of them, but now he's given another reason why he chose one over the other. Is that a racially neutral reason? No, Your Honor. That is the kind of flawed analysis that the Isn't Batson that the problem we have in, in this whole area? 
Is it trial counsel and prosecutors are picking out these reasons and not really telling us the underlying reason? We, we suspect, Your Honor. And, and, and how can, and, and how can we develop, how can we develop, how can, can you help us develop mm -hmm. a test that we can get to the real reason and, okay. and get away from these okay. imaginary? Mm -hmm. I think Slappy does that very nicely for us, Your Honor. Let's, let's walk through um, the, the five Slappy factors and, and apply them here. The first Slappy factor is that the alleged group bias is not shown to be shared by the juror in question. We, what, it, what does that mean? Well, I, I had trouble with that. It, it, it can mean many things, but, but what it means here is whether the, the, um, whether the, whether the reason actually comports to um, our, our, or I should say, uh, is seen in the voir dire answers of, of Sergeant Edwards. Again, if you look at just, um, just, uh, the wording that this will be a learning experience and then not look at everything else that is said uh, thereafter, uh, then certainly uh, on the face the, uh, the uh, prosecutor's a explanation would seem race neutral. But then when you take into account what else was said, it raises a question, a uh, significant question. Failure to examine the juror or perfunctory uh, examination, that did not take place here. Singling out the juror for a special question designed to evoke a certain response. We submit that happened here. Now, if Sergeant Ju Justice was asked the same question, there's a strong likelihood that he may have given the same answer based on the same level of confusion he had for an understanding of what uh, beyond the reasonable doubt meant and preponderance of the evidence. Four, the prosecutor's reason is unrelated to the facts of the case. That doesn't per se apply here, because facts of the case includes not only the facts, but witnesses, um, uh, temperament, and demeanor. Fifth, a challenge based on reasons equally applicable to jurors who are not challenged. Again, Sergeant Justice, uh, his voir dire, uh, we submit, is- I think we have a problem with that factor in the military, though, with our one challenge rule. Well, Your Honor, maybe uh, I, I'm not too sure how the court can, can, can resolve that tension between the military's one peremptory strike. Perhaps, ultimately, uh, the, mil uh, the military will consider, uh, as Justice Marshall considered in, in Batson, doing away with, with the peremptory strike. If it's, if it's just one, then it's not that important. Because certainly, and, and, and the reason why I would encourage the, the court to, to take that view is that if the concern that the prosecutor had about Sergeant Edwards not being able to um, appreciate and fully understand his role as a juror, if that concern was still equally in the prosecutor with respect to Sergeant Justice, Sergeant Justice still stays on the, on the jury and creates whatever problems that, that the prosecutor was concerned about within the process. So, so that concern doesn't go away. Either, either the peremptories would have to be expanded or they would have to be done away with to, to, to ease the tension between Batson's requirements and, and, and the military rules. In, in your brief, uh, you, you contrast Edwards and, and Justice in, in their understanding of the, the process. But I think what the, the trial counsel you know, at least, you know, we're, we're bound by the records, and, and, and uh, what he said there is that, uh, that this learning experience thing uh, was not someone that, that he wanted on, on his jury. And, and the judge accepted it. He turned to the defense counsel and says, do you want to be heard on anything? And the defense counsel said, no, sir, nothing further. And let's look at what, what Sergeant Edwards said that, that really caused this. I feel, sir, basically, this is when he's asked, why, how does he feel about sitting as a member of this uh, very important uh, jury, one that's going to decide uh, perhaps a life or death and, uh, of Corporal Curtis? I feel, sir, basically that it would be a learning experience. And then he goes on and say, and in coming in with an open mind, being able to give everything, uh, he goes on. 
And, but he finally winds up saying, it would be a good experience for me and something that I would like to go through, sir. I mean, uh, aren't people looking for a jury on, uh, with people who are, are willing to serve the community? And, and uh, President Kennedy said, ask not what you know, your country can do for you, but for what you can do for your country. I mean, it, don't you want you people see on the jury that that are, are, are not to say, boy, this is going to be a good experience for me. Don't you want them to say, gee, this is an awesome responsibility for me, uh, and I will try to do my duty, you know, to, to make sure this person is either guilty or, or innocent, and I will, I will do my, my duty in the justice system. You, you, Your Honor. Uh, why isn't that yeah. a good reason? Your Honor, someone could easily say, and in fact, some of the best legal minds in this country could say, this case, this particular case represents a tremendous learning experience for me. Justice Scalia could say in Texas versus Johnson, the flag burning case, this case represents a great learning experience for me. The words in themselves don't mean anything. Uh, and, and, and if we, and, and what I mean by that, Your Honor, is, is that it's almost as vacuous as, as what this court found in, in Moore with, with, with a quizzical look. The words could mean someone who's dumb as a rock. The words could mean someone who wants to be, uh, who has an extreme interest in the case, who is going to be open-minded. Every quality that you would want in a good juror could also be had in those words. Well, I, all right, I think uh, unless there's any Further questions? Uh, uh, I see you've run out of time, but we'll give you some time to, to wind up your argument, sir. Okay, Your Honor. I, I certainly can. The, the utility of establishing a framework like the SLAPI uh, factors would be that it would do away with this court having to be placed again and again in an awkward position of having to second guess what the trial judge meant, what the defense counsel uh, 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 meant. By, by, by not responding. It, it, it would do away with, with appeals which will ultimately result more often than not in Dubai hearings. Secondly, it will establish a, fl a framework for, anal for analyzing the pretext and will also aid the trial courts in determining how to gauge the legitimacy of a proffered race neutral explanation. We urge the court to adopt the SLAPI standards in this case apply them and rule accordingly. We submit that on application of the SLAPI criteria, this court will determine that a race-neutral explanation, the one that was given, was pretextual. Finally, we recognize, as this court noted in Davila, and we applaud it, that the armed services has been a leader in eradicating race discrimination within this society. For this reason, especially in the context of a capital case where race discrimination was a central issue, this court, this court can ill afford to sanction the striking of an African American who was singled out for special questioning when a white member, equally challengeable, was permitted to stay on the jury. Thank you, Your Honors. Well, thank you. At this time, we'll hear a rebuttal from the government. Colonel Uberman. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> the case regarding the life option you asked about, sir, is Blystone v. Uh, Pennsylvania. 110 Supreme Court, 1078, I believe. Blythe. Blystone v. Pennsylvania. Does that sound right, Mr. Moore? And the page in the record of trial where the judge actually gave the instruction to the members that they are at liberty to arrive at a lesser sentence based on their own evaluation of the evidence presented is page 826. That's 826, Your Honor. There are three main points I would like to make in rebuttal to, uh, to the argument of the amicus. First is to disagree with the uh, conclusion that the reason for the challenge of Staff Sergeant Edwards was equally applicable to Sergeant Justice. Both did indicate some difficulty with uh, certain legal concepts. Sergeant Justice, as his voir dire indicates, was very scrupulous about asking to have terms defined. He may have been slow, but he was steady. Staff Sergeant Edwards, in addition to having some difficulty with basic concepts, also gave some indication that he didn't have a sufficiently serious attitude. That was a significant difference. And the, um, the second thing I would like to, um, to respond to is the, um, 
the point in the end, uh, the argument on behalf of the amicus that the judge has the duty under Batson v. Kentucky. That is true, but that duty arises, that, that is, the judge has the duty to inquire into the basis for the reason, but that duty arises only after a prima facie case of racial discrimination has been made out. In our system, because of the Moore rule, which eliminates that part of the analysis and just automatically requires the articulation of the reason, there's been no prima facie showing of discrimination. And so I submit that uh, there's, there's less reason to shift such a duty to the judge. And in this particular case, where there was no objection to the explanation, there's even less of a reason to shift such well, a duty to a, a judge. Well, haven't a lot of states gone to a prima facie case rule, too, just because for expediency, if nothing else? Well, Florida certainly hasn't, Your Honor. The, the slappy rule, and that's why I cited the Taylor case, is only triggered after a prima facie case of discrimination. I think South Carolina adopted a, maybe I'm just going to in my fact, own In fact, in the Taylor case, what the Florida State Supreme Court said was that merely challenging uh, a member, of, a single member of the accused's own race doesn't, uh, doesn't establish a prima facie case of discrimination. So, so the, the heavy duty on the judge, the heavy burden, is only after such a case has been established, and that was not done here, and there was no objection to the explanation which would have put him on notice to inquire further. I would also submit to the court that if we apply this, uh, uh, let me not be misunderstood here, I don't think we should adopt the slappy test. Article 36 instructs us to uh, follow the procedures that are applicable in the federal courts to the extent they may be practicable. And, and the procedures outlined by the Supreme Court in Batson and Hernandez are the federal procedures based on the federal constitution, and they are practicable uh, in this court. And in particular, the federal rule is concerned with actual discrimination that is purposefully intended. The, the Florida rule uh, is an extension based upon the strong likelihood of discrimination and the appearance. So there is a different standard there. Um, but the, the five slappy factors do not necessarily um, uh, resolve the question in the appellant's favor. And, and by the way, another contour of the slappy rule that has not been mentioned is that um, these, these factors are not exclusive or exhaustive. This, the slappy court uh, said that itself. Um, and if we look at those five factors, I'm not sure I know what the first one means either about the alleged group bias not being shown to be shared by the juror in question. But I do know that the challenge in this case was based upon the individual proclivities of this particular person. So he was shown by his own response to the question to, to have an attitude that was not as serious as others. And that was an open-ended question to which he could have said anything, so the answer he chose to give, I submit, is somewhat revealing. The second factor is failure to examine the juror or perfunctory examination. Here there was a, a detailed examination by the trial counsel. It was the defense counsel who didn't examine him. And to the extent no further examination was done, it's because the explanation was not challenged. Third is singling out the juror for special questioning designed to evoke a certain response. Now certainly this juror was asked a question no one else was asked, but I submit it most certainly was not designed to evoke a particular response. To the contrary, it was an open-ended <coughs> question to which he could have given any response. And so for that reason, it is a revealing answer. And finally, the challenge is based on reasons equally applicable to a juror who was not challenged. I believe I've already answered that. Uh, there were two things of concern with regard to this juror. His, his inability to grasp or his difficulty grasping certain concepts and the fact that he would look on it as a learning experience. Only one of those concerns applied to Sergeant Justice that he had some difficulty with some of the concepts. An analogy that comes to my mind is suppose airline passengers could voir dire the flight crew and during the questioning the co-pilot said, I'm gonna look on this flight as a learning experience. Would it be understandable if one of the passengers might want to use a peremptory challenge against the co-pilot, given the serious nature of the undertaking? And over and over again in the voir dire, in the argument of the trial counsel, we see his concern to convey to the members the serious nature of these proceedings. And so that was not a pretext, I submit. Your Honors, in conclusion, I would like to say that Curtis was not sentenced to death because of the color of his skin. He was sentenced to death because of the brutality of his crimes, unameliorated by the extenuation and mitigation offered in his behalf. He was sentenced to death because of the cowardly way in which he murdered James Lutz and the savage way in which he murdered Joan Lutz. Because his premeditated, aggravated, and remorseless crimes 
substantially outweighed the extenuation and mitigation in his behalf. Death as the ultimate punishment is appropriate for premeditated aggravated murder as the ultimate crime, and in this case, the accused has committed two such crimes. This the law permits and this justice requires. Accordingly, I ask this court to affirm the death sentence in this case. On behalf of the government and people whose laws have been violated, on behalf of the military service whose good order and discipline have been prejudiced, on behalf of the military community whose peace and security have been shattered, and on behalf of two bereaved families whose loved ones have been murdered. Thank you, Your Honors. All right, thank you. We'll now hear a rebuttal from the counsel for appellant, Lieutenant Commander Holt. I'd like to bring the men back in one more time. Okay. I think it's important to uh, keep in front of us exactly what happened, the way this finally came out. The ten members, and then we'll talk about uh, the member that was excluded. First of all, on the instruction issue, Colonel Lubberman started his argument by saying that every member is a king. We wish the judge had instructed the jury that every member is a king. It only takes one vote in a death penalty case. At the page, the record of trial cite that the, def uh, the government invited the judge to consider, never was the jury informed that one individual jury, juror or member in that own juror's personal deep down feelings, believing that the accused in this case should not get the death penalty, that is sufficient. Juror independence is the essence of what death penalty deliberations is about. Every man is a king. Those instructions are defective. With respect to the other issue, this is a pretext challenge. The reason it's a pretext challenge is because of what was said and the total circumstances of the case. This is a capital case, a black on white alleged crime, a crime that occurred. The, the circumstances of the whole trial were racially charged. The prosecutor knew that from the very beginning. Race was the ultimate issue. Look again at the prosecutor's rebuttal arguments in the merits. It's all about race. And with race as the issue, the prosecutor challenged the one junior black juror. If we just look at exactly what the, the, the chess men on the table show, four black jurors four black members and the most junior one is gone. That in itself raises questions to anybody that's been around a courtroom. That in itself, removing the junior black man. Judge Cox, you have uh, asked and so has Judge Everett, give us the standard. Uh, I submit to the court that the Hernandez opinion just decided within the last several weeks is the standard and it's this. It's not what we say, it's what we do. That's what is important about Hernandez. Hernandez said race neutral, but then what did they do? Then the Supreme Court of the United States went through an analysis looking at the total facts. Judge Everett, in response to your concern, they didn't say the mere fact that uh, the uh, juror couldn't uh, accept the uh, uh, Hispanic interpretation of the confession. They didn't stop there. They went through the facts and made an analysis. This court is faced, as any court is, with the totality of the circumstances, the totality of the facts, and we would submit that the key in that regard is the challenge was intentional, the response was delayed, there was a refusal to response, there was a, was a delay, and most of all, at, before the delay, before the delay, the prosecutor misstated the law. This case is about Batson, which precludes discrimination against any citizen any citizen because of his race, not because of uh, discrimination against all. It becomes that simple. So if we look at and distinguish the case from Batson, we see that the totality of the circumstances is that there was a challenge because of race. One major concern that this court has is, is both the military judge and the Navy Court of Military Review never addressed the facts that we're discussing in argument today. 
The Navy Court of Military Review, in its bats and analysis, never says this is a black on white crime. Race was the central issue in the case. They never even discussed that. The, on footnote 11, they say we will not be speculative as to the reasons. But that's exactly what we've done here today. Colonel Uberman keeps talking about his motive was something less than. There's conjecture. It was his opinion. These words keep filtering into our analysis today. The law shouldn't require that. When a citizen is removed from the panel under circumstances where it is because of his race, the law should require an explicit statement. And that's what Batson does. It's not there. So the conjecture is inappropriate. What would have been, in your view, a race-neutral statement that, that the defense would have been satisfied with? Or is that, is that junior black member is he exempt from being knocked off by a peremptory challenge? Uh, you know, what would uh, be a race-neutral basis for removing a yes. juror number eight? Give me. That's the government's uh, responsibility to articulate a basis. Based on the uh, analysis and reading of the record, he appeared to be an excellent juror. And but see, how about it's not it's not experience. I mean, I mean, do do you want someone on there that's uh, that's that's going to be? Uh, uh, looking upon this not as a duty but as a great experience and uh, a learning experience for them or a good experience as, as he said? We take it in the total context. His learning experience and he said he would uh, like to participate in the justice process. We'd say that uh, uh, a juror that comes in and says he wants to listen to the facts, weigh the evidence, is exactly what the court system should require. A, a juror that's curious. Most importantly in this regard, the government makes the position that there were no questions asked. And so that was a good reason to challenge that particular question, uh, juror. I invite the court's attention to page 230. 230, the defense counsel in voir dire asked no questions to uh, Gunnery Sergeant Davenport. Gunnery Sergeant Davenport was this juror. So if we use as the reason for the challenge was the defense counsel asked no questions, this juror goes not the most junior black juror. That reason again, speculation today, no questions asked. That one's specious. Well, it, it seems to me that in the military community we have a unique uh, way of analyzing this, and that would be, for lack of a better term, we could call it the letter to the convening authority to explain to the general why you decided to overrule him on his selection. In other words, the convening authority selected Sergeant Edwards and now the trial counsel is rejecting him, and, and uh, if he had to explain to the convening authority why he was rejecting his choice, that might be a good way to do it. There are varieties. At least, I mean, at least we would know he could write, Dear General, I reject Edwards because he wants this as a learning experience, and we don't need anybody down here with that attitude or something. I mean, you know, there might be a way we could do it. The, we have again, a unique way. They don't have that in the civilian. We, we have a variety of ways. Another very clear way would have been the, 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 the uh, prosecutor in the case should have, could have stated on the record, I didn't challenge this man on the basis of race. Government, uh, the government counsel has said that the prosecutor was on notice. Wasn't on notice. Well, he's been on notice since well, this issue's well, been the litigated. the Supreme Court has rejected those kind of assertions. They don't call that a, an explanation. That's not it. an explanation. That's exactly right. So we would submit that that's inappropriate. So. I think the most important area in this inquiry becomes one of reliability. And Justice Kennedy, who wrote also Hernandez in Powers v. Ohio, again addresses racial discrimination. And he says, the real problem is, is that there's discrimination in fact. And discrimination in fact goes to the reliability of the process. And see, that's what's involved here. Because once we remove a jury of 10 down to a jury of nine. We're concerned about reliability. Your concurring opinion, Chief Justice, uh, in, in the Curtis case, phase one, talked about uh, the 12-man jury issue. And you opined, uh, if, if it were your option, that it would be 12 men in a capital case. Those exact personal concerns as an individual are relevant in the Batson challenge. Because what we did is we reduced the panel as the convening authority, the general, had sat at 10 down to 9. There was less diversity, less discussion, greater homogeneity. And it only took one to vote for life. 
So what's at essence in the case is reliability. And then Justice uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, again in Powers v. Ohio, talks about the perception of reliability. And he said the, the essence of the reason to exclude, uh, to exclude the racial discrimination against a black citizen is so the citizens accept the verdict with reliance on the reliability. And where there's been intentional discrimination against one citizen because of his race, there can't be public acceptance of the decision of the fact-finding body. So what we've done is excluded a man, reduced reliability in fact, and reduced the, question, uh, reduced the perception of reliability. And all of these factors, if we had this type of analysis in the Navy court opinion or the, or the military judge had expressed some concern, but in, in, in uh, fairness to the military judge, it was a little early. But the court has never been satisfied with the fact that it was just a little early. And again, you've applauded the judge taking the initiative when they saw the issue and requiring a specific statement. The final point is, and this goes back to Hernandez, the fundamental es essential dimension of Batson is discrimination against an individual citizen against an individual. Uh, Colonel Uberman, I take issue with his point in talking about Hernandez. He says it has to be discrimination in intent and effect. Her, I, I couldn't agree, disagree more on the law. As a matter of fact, Hernandez says explicitly that the effect is irrelevant if there is no intent. In other words, if, there, if you can unequivocally establish there is no racial intent, the fact that it has a discriminatory effect is not the basis to substantiate a Batson challenge. So the, Justice Kennedy was just the opposite of what the, the government uh, proposed as an analysis, just the opposite of what government counsel offers to the court. We would submit that the critical part of the case is the d uh, diminution of reliability. Colonel Uberman, Colonel Uberman talked about the facts and in, in his concluding argument dwelled on the, uh, the crime. And it's a tragedy. Anyone that's been associated with this case has said that it's, a, it's an extraordinary tragedy. And everyone has struggled for an explanation. And the key is, is that we're at a process where our focus at this point in time is not on those facts of the merits. Our concern is the focus on the process the focus on the process. And in conclusion, I would invite this court's attention to um, the inscription of Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence. On his uh, monument at Monticello, it says, here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia Religious Freedom, and the father of the University of Virginia. Because of these testimonies that I live by, I wish to be most remembered. The reason he chose those three things is because Jefferson was a believer in liberty and freedom and an opponent of tyranny. As the author of the Declaration of Independence, he stated and lived against the tyranny of government. He also saw the tyranny of religion and he authored the Declaration of Virginia Religious, uh, uh, the Statute of uh, Virginia Religious Liberties. And then as a opponent against the tyranny of ignorance, he authored or fathered the University of Virginia. Uh, Chief Judge, you focused repeatedly on the fact that a black man said it would be a learning experience. That's, that's a desire to learn a desire to overcome ignorance, a desire to participate in the justice process, to sustain a challenge on that basis, we would say would be the antithesis of to uphold uh, free thought, free thinking. And so it's with exactly those sentiments in mind that uh, what's at essence here today is because a citizen states that he wants to learn and, and participate the, the state can challenge a man because of his race. And that's government tyranny, uh, government discrimination. 
That's the essence of Hernandez. Uh, Judge Cox and Judge Everett, it's what the Supreme Court did in Hernandez. They engaged in exactly the type of analysis we've invited this court to do today. The total facts, the challenge, the response, the failure to disclose, the pretext, and finally, an Article 25 member chosen by the convening authority, he chose who he wanted. There was no reason except because of his race that juror number eight was removed. We ask to focus on the process and to reverse this case. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think this case has been well argued on both sides, and we've had some helpful submissions from uh, Mikas, the uh, NAACP in here, and uh, uh, we will take the case under submission, and an opinion will be issued in due course. At this time, uh, the court is adjourned. been watching coverage of arguments in a death penalty case before the U.S. Court of Military Appeals. This is part of C-SPAN's continuing commitment to bring you coverage of the courts and the judicial branch of government. In this case, U.S. v. Curtis, the judges heard arguments regarding the constitutionality of the military's death penalty and what role race may have played in the murder conviction of Corporal Ronnie Curtis. A decision in the case could take as much as six months. For other coverage of judicial issues, we invite you to tune in each Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. This week, you'll hear a review of the 1990 Supreme Court term by Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Again, that's Chief Justice Rehnquist this Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Recently, C-SPAN's Viewer Information Department received these letters regarding our 1992 election coverage. I just saw an ad for Road to the White House. I'm glad you have this program. However,